welcome to what makes you tick. T I Q. Think, imagine, question. Right, anyway. <laughs> you know, the scientific consensus is that the climate is shifting. We see it all around us. Frequently we experience extreme environmental conditions. And the question is, how do we respond? As an architect, I designed the built environment around us. And what interests me is how humans can manipulate the terrestrial conditions in a constructive and sensitive way. This is ultimately how the research journey begins. <laughs> the quest of discovery, if you will, from understanding the fundamental physical world to exploring the lateral ingenuity and innovation for extreme environments in space. Intent is for the collated data to be shared as a resource and inform the design of the built environment from macro to micro scale. We study the natural world and speak to some of the frontier thinkers, astronomers and space engineers. First, we visit CERN, the European Organization for Nuclear Research in Geneva, Switzerland. This is a place where profound questions are being posed. What is the nature of our universe? What is it made of? The scientists probe the fundamental structure of the particles that make up everything around us. They do so using the world's largest and most complex scientific instruments. What we observe is that, like the International Space Station, CERN is an example of humanity putting politics aside and collaborating for a meaningful cause. It is an amazing feat of ingenuity and engineering, that akin to the historic technological achievement in construction of the Giza Pyramid Complex. The millions of components and materials that are manufactured around the world and then transported to site where they are used to construct huge scale machines that offer an unprecedented level of functional precision are stunning. There are literally hundreds of synchronized engineers and technicians developing, building, testing and maintaining these machines. Everything started at the moment of the Big Bang, 13.8 billion years ago. Time and space begin when a tiny point full of energy starts expanding at an incredible rate. An unimaginable amount of energy transforms into matter and antimatter. Shortly after, all antimatter has disappeared and only a tiny fraction of matter is left. Still enough for all stars and planets in our universe. In the first three minutes, protons and neutrons form the lightest nuclei, while the universe continues to expand and to cool down. But it takes almost 400,000 years until hydrogen and helium atoms can form. Now the universe has become transparent. Light from this era can still be seen today as the cosmic background radiation. Gravity begins to pull the hydrogen and helium together. Stars are born. Fusion inside the stars forms heavy nuclei, the base of life. 
and these building blocks form the suspense and starts dying in giant explosions. After 9 billion years, gravity pulls some of these remnants together to form our solar system with our planet Earth, where evolution gives rise to life, intelligence and consciousness. The synchrocytotron is ready. 
and CERN's first accelerator comes to life. The purpose of the synchrocytotron is to produce and study new particles. Before accelerators were available, such particles could only be observed in cosmic ray experiments. The new machine accelerates protons to 80% the speed of light, producing millions of new particles when those protons collide with the target, giving scientists the opportunity to make systematic measurements. Operation of the FC requires a sequence of actions. Massive pumps extract the air from the vacuum chamber so that protons do not collide with gas molecules during their acceleration. In the proton source, hydrogen gas is ionized and a cloud of protons is injected into the middle of the synchrocytotron. The accelerator makes use of magnetic and electric fields. The magnetic field is produced by a current of 1,800 amps flowing through the coils of the huge magnet. Two D-shaped electrodes with opposite polarity are fixed inside the vacuum chamber in the middle of the magnet. Protons have a positive charge and are drawn towards the negative electrode as they traverse the gap between the electrodes. The magnetic field forces them to follow a circular trajectory and they return to the gap after one half turn. Meanwhile, the radio frequency generator reverses the polarity between the two electrodes. The protons are now attracted to the opposite electron and gain more energy. This process is repeated over and over again. Every time the protons make a half turn, they are whipped around faster and the radius of their path increases. After more than 100,000 turns, they have reached an energy of 600 million electron volts and move at 80% of the speed of light. They are now close to hitting the target and the first experiment can begin. 1967, a new idea takes shape called Isol, an isotope separation device. Protons from the synchrocyclotron collide with target nuclei that are split into short-lived fragments, which are then rapidly scrutinized in experiments. The study of such short-lived nuclei with too many or too few neutrons helps to understand how heavy elements are produced in explosion spells. The synchrocyclotron accelerates its last beams in December 1990. After 33 years of an exceptionally long and successful career, the SC is retired. Following the synchrocyclotron's construction, CERN built bigger and bigger accelerators. The proton synchrotron. The intersecting storage rooms. The super proton synchrotron. The Large Electron-Positron Collider and the Large Hadron Collider. Many important achievements were made, some of them being rewarded with the Nobel Prize. The Drift Chamber, which revolutionized particle detection. The cooling of particle beams. The discovery of the carriers of the weak interaction. And the Higgs boson which proves the existence of the brown inlet Higgs field. In 1989, Tim Berners-Lee, while working at CERN, created the World Wide Web, which has since changed our world forever. The Large Hadron Collider will continue to run at higher energy and higher intensity, with more than 11,000 scientists from over 100 nationalities, hoping for new insights into the secrets of the universe. I think that the curiosity and the need to do research is inside our, our, is a part of our humanities, so there will be always a set. So there will be set in the future. What started once as a vision for European science has grown into a unique model for global scientific and technological collaboration. CERN demonstrates how science can unite nations and contribute to a better world.
Next we visit the Royal Observatory in London, UK. We talked to astronomer Anna Ross about extreme environments in space and an attempt to understand what to expect and prepare for as we begin to experience similar climatic conditions locally within the terrestrial context. Anna helps us raise awareness that because the tools and technologies used to observe and analyze space do so from a distance, it will therefore be inefficient and uneconomic as direct replacements. However, the collated data and devices themselves may inform design of instruments and systems specific for terrestrial parameters and technical requirements. The consistent challenge of cosmic radiation remains. Aside of constructing extremely thick shells in terms of structure, canopies, walls, is there a material that can protect against the detrimental effects? And is that even the right question? That's where I was trying to lead into, okay, the extreme environments, you know, in space, so like the moon, yeah. um, Mars, and yeah. Okay, cool. Um, so, my yeah. name is Anna Ross, um, and I'm one of the astronomers here at the Royal Observatory. I have come straight from studying. Um, I did my undergraduate degree in astrophysics a few years ago, and after that, I did a master's in sort of space engineering, so more, hopefully, more applicable to the architecture side of things, which is why you're particularly talking to me. Yeah, so, um, when you're looking at other planets and space in general, um, the main things you want to be concerned with is obviously temperature is a major factor so obviously the general trend is the further you get from the sun the colder it gets so Mars is a lot colder than the earth its average temperatures are like minus 60 degrees um, another thing that affects temperature is how much atmosphere a planet has so again Mars has quite a thin atmosphere so it doesn't retain heat as well so another reason why it's colder the moon also has basically no atmosphere at all so even though it's kind of the same distance from the sun as the earth um, it can't maintain its temperature all the way around sort of it has no way of keeping that heat in so very cold at night very hot during the day I believe it goes down to about minus 127 sort of near the equator and up to 173 degrees during the day there are places on the moon that get a lot colder because there's sort of permanently shadowed regions that never see the sun, such as um, the poles and some craters that have like high ridges and deep shadows, so lots of very cold places on the moon but also very hot, so yeah, temperature is a big one. Um, other things to be concerned with is radiation. So out in space there's two main types of radiation, radiation from the sun and background cosmic radiation. Um, so on Earth, we're protected, by, protected from solar radiation by our magnetic field. Um, Mars and the Moon are both very similar in that they don't really have a magnetic field, so nothing to protect from any of that. Um, if you're looking in space to put a spaceship or anything out there, solar radiation is quite easy to protect from just by sort of normal spaceship materials. Nothing too extreme, just sort of metals, that kind of thing. Um, but galactic radiation, cosmic radiation, is more of an issue. Um, our atmosphere is the one that protects us here on Earth from that. Um, but again, as I said before, the Moon and Mars don't really have any atmosphere or much thinner. And that's a lot harder to protect from. Um, mainly because um, the way it works is that when it hits a substance, that radiation, it kind of knocks into the atoms that make up that substance and put out secondary radiation and that is the radiation that is really dangerous particularly for astronauts because if that radiation hits your skin then it's kind of um, yeah kind of not very good to sort of have the secondary radiation going through your body one of the main one of the big causes of cancer in astronauts things like that so um, that's sort of an area that is less well known as how to protect from that um, so the sort of proposed solutions at the moment are really thick shielding, which is obviously not ideal, especially if you're going off to other planets trying to launch large amounts of material, you want kind of as light a load as you can to launch away. Um, and there are some sort of technologies being looked at into sort of better materials that are thinner, but as far as I'm aware at the moment there's no sort of ideal solution to that. Um, so yeah, those are some of the things. Um, another thing would be 
something called MMODs, which are micro meteoroids and orbital decay. So that's sort of just things flying around in space, like little asteroids, little meteoroids, all those kind of things. Again, our atmosphere on Earth protects us, um, but the less atmosphere you have, the more you're going to be impacted. The moon is so obvious of an example of somewhere because obviously you can see all the craters, even from Earth with your eyes, you can see just how many craters are all over the surface, so that is a big problem. Um, gravity as well, I guess. Um, so we, we have evolved as humans for our Earth-like gravity. Um, other planets, depending on how big they are, smaller planets have less gravity and the moon is even smaller again, so that's about 17% of the gravity. Um, the more time you're in microgravity, the weaker your muscles get. Um, that's why astronauts in space have to exercise for at least an hour every day, like very intensely. And even then, as soon as they come back to Earth, they can't walk because they can't even just like stand up again. So yeah, that's quite a big problem. Next we visit the government organisations at the Harwell campus in Oxford, UK. This is a place where you can learn about the space industry, science, technology, engineering, mathematics and design using space technology and data to solve challenges across the earth. We talked to Satellite Applications Catapult team, Joel Freeman, who is the head of the Centre Design, about Earth application of space technology and data, as well as design process. The space race, service and the disruptive age. Joel helps us identify that, in terms of utilising satellites in a prudent way within the built environment, we can look at it in stages. Satellites can help us select a site to develop for specific reasons. We can track and analyze patterns of weather, how often does the location flood, is there subsidence and ground movement with position reflectors, much like the fixed node points that can be pinpointed from space and help measure deformation. We can monitor traffic flow, pollution levels, urban expansion. We can observe which surfaces receive most daylight if you wanted to harness solar energy. Or if you want to grow nutritious crops that require specific climate, soil conditions, certain altitude, you can search for that area with those qualities. You can test and analyze your specific site with regards to seasons where there is most light and what plants may grow in that zone. A useful precedent to review is the NHS Healthy New Towns guidance. Joel noted, say if the doctor diagnosis states you need to be more active. You have a device with an application that tracks your movement. Can it be incentive to be more active? You can cover certain distance and you can get discount on healthy foods. Now you have further incentive to lead an active life and consume high quality nutrition. 
underpinned by satellite technology that is accurate within one millimeter tolerance in the z-axis and approximately 300 by 300 millimeter square resolution pixel as a spatial graphic true as of 2018 evidently if you make data and technology a resource and ultimately a tool that is accessible to people meaning that you do not have to be an expert to use it or have to code it and it works as an add-on or a plug-in into your specialty of consultation then we will experience profound ingenuity and shifts will take place inventions solutions will pop up exponentially Okay, so uh, my name is Joel Friedman. I'm the head of uh, user-centered design at the satellite applications Catapult. Um, my background is in product design and mechanical engineering. Although the space industry is an industry in its own right, it's actually an enabler for countless other industries. Um, satellites can be used uh, to broadcast information. As everyone knows, they can be used to help you know where you're going. They can also be used for agriculture. They can be used for um, disaster recovery and monitoring. They can be used for uh, climate change adaptation, for building future cities, for monitoring transport links, um, for monitoring infrastructure. The, the amount of different industries that are enabled by satellites are, are countless, really. Um, and so what that means is uh, working here is extremely varied and extremely interesting uh, and is one of the reasons that, uh, that I love it. Um, we get to look at how this technology can be applied to solve challenges that are not just in the UK but, but are global uh, as well. Satellite technology can be roughly split into three buckets. Um, the first is communication, so um, passing data all around the world, um, creating connectivity um, everywhere really, from uh, Internet of Things devices sending very small bits of information. You know, it could be a sensor on a plant in the middle of the desert um, telling you how much rain there's been um, versus um, streaming video, uh, Skyping with your family while you are in your autonomous vehicle driving across the UK as well. So the, the range of communication, it's really about um, giving us access to information wherever we are. Um, the second bucket is navigation. Um, so understanding or, or positioning really, understanding where on earth we are and where other things are. You know, that's something that is so fundamental now, we almost take for granted um, that we can position ourselves, that we can type in the name of a shop on Google and know exactly where it is. It doesn't matter what country it's in. That ability to know where things are and know where you are is, is hugely powerful. Um, and there's another level to it, which is not just where things are, but how they're moving as well. So by seeing how something's moving, you can start to uh, infer characteristics about its behavior. Um, so for example, uh, we have a, um, a demonstrator uh, that was uh, a project that turned into a commercial uh, service uh, which is focused on illegal, unreported and unregulated fishing. It's a huge problem around the world. Um, the ocean is very big, it's very difficult to know what boats are doing. Um, but actually uh, there is a system on boats that is mainly for uh, identification um, and uh, collision avoidance called AIS um, and it can be tracked from space. So. If a boat has its AIS on, broadcasting who it is, um, you can see where it's going. Um, and so you can look at, okay, well here's an area that's protected, and here's a boat going through it. And if I look at the way it's moving, um, based on how the system has been trained, it knows that, well actually that is very indicative of tuna fishing, or two boats moving together is very indicative of a transshipment uh, as well. So a system can start to flag up areas of suspicious activity. Even, you know, there was a boat heading towards this protected area and it turned off its AAS and all of a sudden it disappeared and then it turned back on over here. There's certain things you can start to infer. Part of our uh, methods 
normally involve um, bringing together lots of different people, different stakeholders, um, and getting them to think creatively around uh, their problems, their challenges. Um, and these sort of co-creation sessions are, are important for a number of reasons. Um, one of them is because you get really um, much more interesting and unique ideas when you get lots of different types of expertise together because they will all think of something that you wouldn't um, and so that that gives you a really rich environment for innovation another is that if you involve someone in the process of designing something they have some ownership over it um, they're more likely to use it and they're more likely to defend it um, and so that's really important from from a, a point of view of developing applications and, and services Transitioning to Mike Curtis Wells, the lead manufacturer in technology. We talk about space technologies, additive manufacturing, on site construction on other planets, and materiality. Mike noted that whilst the space industry is highly competitive, there are many common challenges that can be resolved through collaboration and sharing of ideas. Biomimetics in terms of learning from nature of the living world is crucial. For example, it is prudent to look at the structural properties of trees which will endure long after we are gone. Notice large rocks and boulders that weigh hundreds of tons that have been around for multiple millions of years because they weather the environment. The placement and how it emerges in terms of its constitution, whether it is uh, metamorphic or igneous rock, the structural properties and the chemistry can inform how we construct more durable materials. Keep an open mind and ask questions. <laughs> After all, curiosity is what makes us discover abstract concepts that manifest themselves. Like if we stretch and relax wires in a torsional device, we can generate electricity whilst rotating an object. That is a practical idea that develops in stages. So uh, my name is Mike kettis -Rouse. I'm the lead manufacturing technologist for the Satellite Applications Catapult. So there's some really interesting applications about what can we make in space. And then if you really want to start looking to the future, what do we do beyond Earth? We're going back to the Moon, we'll certainly be on the Moon within 10 years. There's a good probability we'll be in Mars within 20. Where next? Big options. However, um, let's focus a little bit down to where we are today. So today we're in the, what we call new space. New space is a transition from old space. Old space was the domain of the large space agencies and the large um, multinational aerospace companies. NASA, the European Space Agency, companies like Lock Lockheed, Boeing, Northrop Grumman, Airbus. Those companies have defined how space is and they're based on those launch systems like Ariane 5, the Space Shuttle, Atlas, Delta, a whole variety of other launch vehicles and big satellites. satellites typically are the size of anything from a, a small mini car to the size of a bus. They weigh, any, weigh anything from a few kilos to hundreds of kilos, to in some cases many tons. New space is about cheaper, better, faster. It com it's complete dichotomy to old space. How are we going to do things differently? And it's about ultimately cost. Space is expensive. When the space shuttle launched, each launch cost in the region of 350 to 500 million. 
that's not sustainable bearing in mind you can for that launch you can maybe put a maximum of 20 tons in orbit so rockets are cheaper but even um, um, nonetheless effectively a Falcon 9 one of SpaceX's conventional launch vehicles still cost in the region of 60 to 7 million dollars per launch so that's a lot I mean if that numbers come down um, by a factor of five but it's still a lot so space is about building things smaller, smarter, quicker. And new space is very much about building small spacecraft. So I said earlier about spacecraft being big. New space, is there's a big focus on how do we make spacecraft smaller, but how do we still make them effectively functional, useful, effective. And the ways we do that are through a variety of new design philosophies, looking at disruptive technologies where we look into other markets, high performance motorsport engineering for example, new forms of composites, new forms of metal, advanced alloy development. We even look to biology. How do we build complex cellular structures which can absorb impact or absorb radiation? So can we learn from nature in terms of how we build some Something that is fundamentally not even remotely related to nature. We talk to Oxford Space Systems team, Mike Lawton, the founder and CEO. Talk about the systems, materials, industries that inform design and design process, as well as environmental constraints and opportunities in space. Mike raised whilst there are wonderful materials and technologies going into orbit, there are interesting terrestrial application options. For example, a lightweight pop-up structure that can create a safe canopy or bracing if deployed. Certain material properties in terms of composition can be exploited when activated in the strongest dimension. Imagine emergency shelters. Or if you are in a car crash and the car rolls, rather than having a heavy roll cage, install a stowed unit that is lighter, more efficient and deploys like an airbag. Okay, digging underground and supporting the earth from collapse. Or take advantage of the very intense ultraviolet radiation in space in combination with soft, pliable materials which become stiff when exposed to UV. So, if you have an inflatable membrane stowed incredibly small for launch, inflate it on orbit as you do not require much air pressure to inflate it and let the UV cure it, then remove the air pressure and you have a special intervention you can inhabit. My name is Mike Lawton. I am the founder and CEO of Oxford Space Systems and we are a space hardware business. We're venture capital backed which means we have to be doing really exciting things with technology in order to uh, secure the level of external investment that we have and the exciting technologies we're developing are deployable structures for space and by deployable structures we mean things like antennas, boom systems and deployable panels. 
this is what we call a metal mesh and I can be really quite brutal with it. I can scrunch it up but then if I tension it in the appropriate way I can end up with a super smooth surface. So the wire we're using here has to have a whole range of properties as you might imagine to survive in space. When we subject, subject it to temperature extremes we don't want to expand and contract too much because it would then distort. So we need a wire with a very good coefficient of thermal expansion or CTE. We also want the uh, wire to survive an ATOX environment but most importantly we need it to behave like a great reflector RF surface. So we end up using a type of metal called gold plated molybdenum or gold plated moly. The molybdenum wire gives us the strength and the thermal properties we want with a very thin layer of gold on top. That soft metal that when we tension the underlying molybdenum wire it causes the gold to bite into itself because gold's a very soft metal and that then forms a very very good electrical surface because when we're flying through the upper wisps of the atmosphere in low earth orbit that can build up a charge and cause a static problem. So gold plated molly helps dissipate those charges and gives us a lovely electrical surface. This is rather dull and not looking gold because this isn't gold plated molly. This is a tungsten wire that we use to carry out all our R&D with. So if we can prove it works with a much cheaper wire such as tungsten we can then replicate it with gold plated molly. Now some usual th unusual things about what we're, we're doing here and uh, most people are surprised that we actually look to the fishing industry to make space antennas. So a very what might be seen as a low-tech historic industry on Earth is helping the space industry. And the reason we look at the fishing industry is when you think about fishing nets, they actually have a lot of the same challenges we have with space antenna surfaces. So if you want a fishing net, you want to be able to scrunch it up to put it on, on the back of a boat, but you want to be able to deploy it and go fishing with it without it tangling. So we need knitting patterns that don't lend themselves to tangling. The other big challenge with a fishing net is if it gets a hole in it, you don't want rip propagation, you want the hole to be maintained. Well on orbit, if we have a micrometeorite go through our antenna, the last thing we want to do is have the antenna rip open. So actually what we do is borrow fishing patterns from fishing nets to knit antenna surfaces. But of course we're not using twine, we're using wires in this case that are even thinner than the diameter of a human hair which causes us a lot of challenges when you're trying to knit in a very precise way at those sorts of dimensions. So there's an example of an antenna surface that when I apply it to this type of backing structure and we tension it, we get a very, very high storage efficiency but fantastically performing uh, RF antenna. Technology officer Dr. Juan Reveles highlighted that typically many of the techniques used in space are coming from civil engineering. The idea of the deployable dome, for example. So it is intriguing to see the process to come back around 
and start to inform the other way. So, my name is Shifali Sharma and I am the Senior Commercial Strategist at Oxford Space Systems. Um, my background really is in engineering as well. My bachelor's was in uh, aircraft engineering and from there on I moved to um, uh, pursuing a master's in space engineering and astronautics. Yeah, you've got it exactly. So we, we don't just do it all in-house. We're very, very collaborative. Well, industry and company more so. So we work actually work with the uh, sort of industry leader, so to speak, in origami engineering. And he just happens to be just at our doorstep, ex Oxford University, and yeah. that's a Chinese professor, Dr. Zong Yu we, we work with and we've worked with him since the beginning of the days and um, this was also one of the concepts we've worked with him to, to further mature um, so yeah that's that's exciting times but how did we come up with the idea you might have seen uh, in in recent uh, news you know companies like ISI Capella uh, Space, they're all coming up with this application called SAR, which is Synthetic Aperture Radar. So it's about imaging Earth uh, from space. Uh, so usually you would do that with airborne systems, but we're now, now trying to enable that ser sort of service, but through satellites. Um, so you don't have to worry about what the sort of weather is on the day, you don't have to worry about cloud formation, you can just take you know, very clear, uh, high resolution pictures of Earth, so to speak. So all these companies are trying to achieve that. And the, one of the biggest uh, sort of criteria or, or challenges is having a large surface area for your antenna. So it can take as many pictures as possible and can achieve whatever the mission can achieve. Um, so that's where this idea for origami sat came in. What if the whole satellite was an antenna on the solar, solar panel? So yeah, that's that's what we're doing. Um, you know, we are looking sort of horizon scanning and uh, coming. Tr one of the big uh, aspects of a venture capital backed business is to come up with new ideas and make sure there's always that growth potential. Mm -hmm. And we're, so we're always looking for new ideas. I wonder, have you uh, are you already considering? Maybe doing something, uh, as we spoke with Michael before, um, something more local to Earth. Are you thinking of uh, coming up with structures? I know you're focused Terrestrial. on space. Terrestrial. Yeah, sure. yeah, actually, because yeah. Uh, that's a very good question. And <laughs> believe it or not, we get a lot of terrestrial interest. And reason for that is, if you look at the space environment, it's quite harsh from the perspective of, say, temperature extremes or radiation. Um, and um, similar sort of uh, environment is seen in say nuclear or, or oil and gas industry as well. So our structures will withstand uh, forces say or, or impact which will be seen by structures in that operating in that industry. So marine even. Uh, so, so yeah we get quite a few inquiries. So that is also one of the routes to market is ones but space is our key focus and we have to deliver that for sure but when we as and when we are you know as we are growing and and scaling up i don't see why we can't you know sort of venture into terrestrial markets uh, high-tech terrestrial markets so to speak what is there anything that you would consider quite interesting for yourself specifically or for the you know sorry for me straight away I'm thinking okay emergency shelters you know those are the sort of kind of not obvious but it's like oh, okay that makes sense you can do exactly structures that deploy quickly uh, even antennas the pop-up antennas which yeah. the uh, soldiers in the battlefield you know they yeah. can just have those pop-up antennas in their uh -huh. in the backpack because yeah. that's what the concept is about very storage efficient very small and low mass so you can imagine in the battlefield when they're out and about, you can just have those antennas for comms uh, and things like that. Uh, even the boom systems, we I think had a, 
um, a few inquiries one of the inquiries was around having our telescopic boom system and it was like a submarine which will even only emerge uh, they wanted to do the scanning of um, horizon scanning uh, whatever uh, ships were on the on the horizon they didn't want to make themselves obvious so it was a sort of technology uh, a defense security type of application but they wanted to say use our boom system that could go up with the antenna do the scanning and then come back down so so things like that i think there's a a lot of uh, overlap of technology and hence that cross fertilization world we, we talked of so yes we do we do see a lot of potential uh, for the technology to venture into terrestrial but it's just that's one of the challenges of a small team when you know the, the four key focus has to stay with space and how much of your resources can you actually let go of to to invest in those domains is a is another is another great challenge to have I think. We we'll speak to Michael Loweth, the business development manager, about new space, analysis, scale technology, hardware, infrastructure, telecommunication, and manned space that inspires innovation. Michael expressed whilst there are space standards and requirements to comply with when developing fit for purpose and reliable technologies and systems, it is important to collaborate with other talented professionals. For example, origami specialists, the kite makers, as techniques and methodologies cross pollinate. It is also important to pay keen attention to the psychological state as well as the physiological, particularly when designing occupational habitats in space. Thank you. So my name is Michael Loweth and I work here at Oxford Space Systems in the business development team. That unity of, of, of humankind, we're not, why are we fighting over that border? There are no borders from space. Um, and how thin the atmosphere is, how we need to look after this planet we're living on. You know, the, the, the Gaia Earth, um, the Green Movement, it, it pretty much began or was embellished and, and grew because of the space in the, because of the space industry and how the astronauts just happened to take a photo of the earth as they were going around the moon and then coming back no one in that industry thought that the most used photo that they ever take that is i think the most used photo in the world is that marble of an earth in the distance that's our planet that's where we live <laughs> we probably should look after it and and it's that kind of inspiration and perspective that space is uniquely empowered to to bring to us you know you could say going and looking at the earth's oceans that that's shown us about how we're throwing away all this plastic how how you know it, it's a similar kind of aspect um, but what space and that manned space opportunity really brings to us is that opportunity to understand how 
the human body operates in this zero g environment. It's the best way for us to understand how osteoporosis affects our bones, how you get this bone wastage, this muscle wastage in zero g because there's no g forcing your bones to stay strong. And that's a problem that affects a vast majority of women as they get older, and, and men as well, but it's one of those ones that's very unfair and focuses on, on the, the you know, old women and as they're going through menopause. Um, and this is one of the best ways to understand that process and to work out how we can reverse that. Um, another example that I'm really passionate about myself is that man's space. We're really looking at how we're going to take people so we can not just visit the moon or, or Mars, but live there. And we're going to have to start being really smart. We're going to create structures that can survive against that harsh radiation environment. So we're going to have to use in, what they call um, in situ resource utilisation. And, and that's where we're going to have to work out how do we use that local dirt, that local material to make our own mud huts, basically. But yeah, we've done that in the past. We, we've been very self-sufficient in the past, but we're not now. And we're, we're still very wasteful now. And if you want to understand how we can actually recycle that much more, how we can be that much kinder to our own planet, it's bizarre, but sending people to Mars and giving them that challenge, you're going to have to reuse all of that water. You're going to have to be self-sufficient on a on a, a, a village scale, well, you're going to get a lot more inspired, intelligent, focused engineers, scientists, people solving that problem. And you can then use those lessons right back home in, in your house. But you're not going to be able to get those people to work in that at home because they won't be inspired, they won't be driven, they won't be challenged. And that's where the benefit of space is so misunderstood. Why do I want to go and look at another planet? We, we, we can't look after this one. It's the other way around. By going and looking at Venus, where you get this massive greenhouse runaway effect for, for, for ages. Go look at what, what's happened there. That will give us the cheat book. That will give us what will happen if we don't look after ourselves. It will be in our face and it will teach us a lot more than we can learn from this planet alone. So I think it's, it is the most expensive area and we don't do much of it, but really we should be doing more because that's where you're going to have to work out how do we build these structures? How do we build them so people don't go mad? You know, if you're disconnected from Earth, you're going to feel very alone. How do you manage that psychology? We've really had to do a lot of psychological analysis to understand how do we make that space station in space, the ISS, somewhere that can be a home for those astronauts for a year. Jeez, going somewhere else, that's even more of a challenge. And those lessons are what we can use here. What colour should our walls be? How do we make an environment that's more creative or, or more conducive to, to cut harmony? These are things that really can be taken to so many other industries, and in architecture particularly. There's a world of challenges for you in the space industry, and a world of lessons for you to learn from what we've already done. And we have done a lot of it, or looked a lot into it, but it won't be known to be correct until we actually get there. The idea is to make the design of the built environment and the architecture accessible to everyone around the world. I talk to space industry professionals on record and share it with you. This research forms a part of the investigation into how safe occupation is designed in response to extreme environments in space. To capture the discoveries and to raise awareness of others, I present to you this research film. Speaking to the source is invaluable and exploring the frontier of innovation 
inspires and informs imaginative ideas when we design a constructive built environment. That's it for now. Thank you for your time. I'll see you next chapter.